you're explicit in conversation regularly with everyone about what are we heading towards and then give everyone sort of the opportunity to understand how their day-to-day activity ties to that, that's how we get the best results. You know, I was afraid to get into sales when I was younger. Um, I thought I was going to be an attorney and and various, you know, turns of events uh, wound me up, you know, talking to a recruiter about a sales job. And initially I was afraid to take it because I thought that was going to be the person who was going to call in the middle of dinner, try and, you know, sell you a credit card that you don't need or, or things like that. And I think a lot of times, you know, we see in movies and, and experiences with bad salespeople that, um, you know, people expect a salesperson to be aggressive. They expect a salesperson to be dishonest. Um, they expect them to be, you know, money motivated ab- above all else. Um, what I've really spent a lot of time thinking about, though, is that sales can be a truly noble profession. And so, you know, when you think about noble sales, a tech salesperson is someone who's actually solving problems for uh, for the businesses that they serve. You know, it's not about me getting a single transaction done with you today, but, you know, a good salesperson is providing a solution to a problem that um, you've really been struggling with. And at the end of it, you'll say, well, I'm so glad I met that salesperson because it advanced my business, and moved us forward. You know, I've been in sales now for over 20 years. Um, and, you know, your, your reputation is part of what makes you successful over time. And so we spend a lot of time on our sales team talking about, you know, what's the integrity of doing sales? Um, you know, we're sitting in the fourth quarter with probably about 60 days before the end of the year. And certainly there's a lot of pressure on our teams to, you know, get your quotas done and make the number and make the company succeed. Um, but not doing it at the expense of your rep- of your reputation or a company's reputation and not doing bad business that, you know, clients are going to be upset about. Yeah, it's a really, really fantastic point. Um, you know, you're a good person to ask about this. Like you said, you've been in sales for 20 years. Uh, what are the broader market changes that might put pressure on the type of sales you described? I mean, we have SaaS, we have churn now, don't we? It's important to form good client relationships. So what have you seen changing and how have you seen that affect how we need to sell? Yeah. So, you know, one of the interesting things, uh, Modus is the company that I work for today, and we have a, a, a piece of our portfolio, which is a, a mobile application people have on their phones when they go driving for work. Um, and they use it to track, you know, the customer visits they've made and the expenses they accrue and stuff like that. And it's given us a lot of visibility into what the nature of work has looked like in the U.S. So from the time the pandemic started, you know, here were how many people were on the road and how many miles they drove a day. And then, uh, you know, we've been able to see as soon as the shutdown happened, you know, how how many people in what parts of the country were adhering to the the lockdown guidances and then what the return has looked like. Um, And I'd say, you know, without diving into all the data, you know, the big theme that we're seeing is uh, companies are spending their dollars a lot more uh, cautiously. You know, a lot of people have had to do headcount reductions. A lot of people have had to, you know, scale back the scope of their operations and and do more with less. Um, And so as we think about what that means to sell next year, um, it's, it's really helping companies figure out more than ever, how do you get the biggest bang from your buck? And of course, we always should have been doing that. Um, but in an economy that's a little bit contracted or where people are being a little bit more cautious on the dollar spend, I think a salesperson has to be even more articulate about the connection between their product, their solution, and a real ROI on it instead of just a, a, a nice to have good feeling that someone throws some cash at it. Yeah. Yeah, superb. You have that kind of insight. Um, Let's bridge this then into your relationship with VPs of sales. Um, You know, kind of what do you look for in a VP of sales? And crucially, um, you know, how do you stretch VPs of sales um, to measure their ability and their performance at the beginning of their tenure? And how (laughs) how do you ensure they create these kinds of cultures we're talking about here? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm actually I'm doing some interviews right now because uh, we are we're fortunate that we're able to grow our team uh, in the coming year. And I, I think there are a few key things that I'm looking for. Um, the first part of my interview is really just trying to get to the the ethics that you bring to your workplace every day. Um, when you get to be a team of, you know, 110 sellers now, uh, people are going to make a lot of decisions every day that 
I don't have any insight into. Uh, I don't know the question has come up, let alone how you're going to answer it. And so I need to put a lot of trust into, you know, the VPs of sales or the team leaders uh, that they're going to make the right decisions and make a decision that I can defend. Um, so, so the first thing that I really want to hear people talk about is just what are the values that that you lead your life by? Um, because if I know where a decision came from and how you arrived at it, I'll be able to defend it even if I don't think it was the right thing. Um, and that's also what's going to ensure that we're going to do good business. I also think a VP of sales needs to be very structured and process oriented. Um, you know, we talk about revenue operations and forecasting, and we want to be really good at forecast accuracy and knowing where deals are coming and having you know, consistent business delivered day by day, month by month, and not one of these sales organizations that, you know, poorly performs until the last day of the quarter and then, you know, throws a 50% discount and has all the business come in on, you know, four days out of the year. Um, so really having a VP in their interview process talk about, you know, what is the process that they use, uh, whether it's a particular sales methodology, but also, you know, what are the measures that they look to, um, you know, on a, on a routine basis so they can keep track of accountability. Um, and then finally, you know, looking at sort of development, you know, how do you, get the most out of, again, a wildly diverse team, knowing that your sellers, you know, operate in different markets um, with buyers that have, you know, different political views or, or you know, different needs. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important to have a sales team that reflects those diverse communities and thinks in, you know, very different ways. Um, but then a, a, a VP has to have a lot of emotional intelligence to lead, you know, sellers that don't necessarily look, act, and think exactly like they do, uh, but can adapt to, you know, different situations. Yeah. And he says something there, which is great, um, which is that, of course, people, VPs, they'll be taking, making decisions every day that you won't have visibility of. It's natural. Um, so it's, it raises an interesting question, you know, to what extent are they involved in the strategy versus tactics? And what's your cadence for ensuring that your strategies and tactics are aligned with theirs? Yeah, so my core leadership team um, has a meeting every three weeks um, where we're checking in on, um, you know, the, the tactical piece. Uh, we get together on a quarterly basis and, and, you know, kind of reset on where's the corporate strategy going, where's this marketing strategy going. And then once a year, we do sort of the annual business planning process. Um, and I've, I, I have sort of my core leadership team, which is the head of hunting sales, farming sales, uh, sales develop SDRs and marketing, um, all sort of at the table, you know, actively participating in that. Um, I think the best organizations, you know, have this kind of top down approach where, you know, the executive team or the board sets out the big vision that next year we want to grow revenue 20%. Um, and then, you know, each division needs to figure out how do I get there? Or, or maybe the board's goal is we want to grow profitability 20%. So, you know, sales needs to grow revenue, operations needs to figure out how they can uh, streamline costs and on and on and on and on. So then if sales is going to drive revenue, then the next layer of management uh, really is going to talk about, well, how do we get there? What are the products that we're going to sell? How many of each product? What's the right mix? And then that kind of you know, gets into individual tactics of sales pitches and messages and, and offerings that an individual rep can, you know, look at their plan and their quota for the year and say, okay, you know, my piece in this, you know, this big corporate chain of goals is I have a million dollar quota and I'm going to get there by doing, you know, six deals of this size with this product and five deals of that size with a different product. Um, so if you've, you know, if you're explicit in conversation regularly with everyone about, you know, what are we heading towards? And then give everyone sort of the opportunity to understand how their day-to-day -day activity ties to that. You know, I think that's how we get the best results. Yeah. Um, part of that, we've just finished our, our business planning for the year, um, is making sure you're setting goals that are actually achievable. So a lot of what I'm doing when I'm doing, um, you know, 2021 planning, isn't just pulling a number out of the sky that says, you know, Next year, I think we can sell $6 million more of this product, but it's really turning to, you know, the data and my sales ops leader is sort of my right hand in this to say, what has our trend been, you know, in each of the product lines? Um, you know, what's, what products are doing well? What products aren't doing well? How long are those sales cycles? How long does it take a new sales rep to come up to speed on that? And then, you know, instead of just throwing a number on a page and saying, here's the goal we're going to set out for, you know, really, how do I think it's actually going to happen with, 
you know, specific sales reps, what's their past performance looked like, and you know, what sort of tweaks can we make that would improve their future performance to get to the goal. Yeah, it's really superb, JD. I mean, a really pivotal piece here, um, which we've touched on and want to go into more detail on is how we create that alignment between revenue teams. But specifically, like you said, we set the strategy, we set the mission. Um, Once that does go down into the tactical level between functional leads, how do we ensure that there's vision into each other's funnels, um, vision and alignment over each other's metrics so that everyone's kind of working together here and they don't become siloed? Yeah. So, you know, I've had the fortune over the last couple of jobs in my career um, to run both the sales and the marketing organizations. And um, I've sort of, I haven't invented it myself, but I've tagged onto this brand of thus marketing organization, um, really trying to break down those barriers that traditionally, you know, sales and marketing are not on the same page. Um, So, you know, from the very beginning, when we're having the visionary goal setting, it's having the sales leaders and the marketing leaders at the same table, agreeing to the same goal and lining up their personal objectives so they're in sync with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, our data says that it takes 17 touches for an opportunity, for a a contact to become an opportunity. Um, And I think in a lot of organizations, there's this argument about, was this a sales lead or a marketing lead? Uh, And in my organizations, the answer is yes. You know, it took 17 touches. It was both sales and marketing activity, and that's okay. And we don't need to fight about the attribution of that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, to support that, we have a whole lot of technology in place that, um, you know, we use We use a really great um, sort of analytics tool that has dashboards and daily reporting. Um, so at the beginning of the year, we set up, you know, here's the metrics of success. And every sales rep knows in order to get one deal closed, I needed to be working three opportunities. You have three opportunities. I had to have had five meetings and had five meetings. I had to have, you know, however many phone calls. Um, So they know what that funnel is and marketing has the same, you know, funnels and flows for them and the SDRs. Um, You know, those are dashboards that we look on a daily basis um, to see where is it going well, where are we getting off and, and where do we need to sort of course correct. The other nice thing about using data in that um, is the tools we use also have a lot of artificial intelligence that can forecast for us and say, based on past performance, you know, I know that Tom is always the sales rep who's a sandbagger and he commits much less than he actually delivers. Or I know that JD is wildly optimistic and he overcommits and he always brings deals in three days late and 20% too short. Um, And so those tools can give us a really accurate forecast on, you know, looking at the metrics and looking at people's individual experience, uh, you know, what's actually going to happen. So by our second week of the quarter, we can look at our data, our data tools, and we predict within $100,000 how we're going to end the quarter um, on a, you know, 26, $28 million, you know, book of business each quarter. Um, And so, you know, past, past performance is the best predictor of, you know, future, future behavior. Um, and using data to kind of support that and having everyone have visibility into that is you know, a key part of how we get there. Yeah, I really love you bring that up because, you know, the second part of the conversation was forecasting how it's changing. Now, machine learning forecasts, they are relatively new in the grand scheme of things. Um, yep. So talk to me, how has forecast changed and how do tools like the ones you're talking about um, change the life of a CRO and what confidences do they give you? I feel a lot more confidence. You know, it, I, in, when I began selling in the early 2000s, you know, a sales rep every quarter had to go to the company meeting and make a revenue commitment and say, you know, I'm going to do $400,000 this quarter. And then, yeah. you know, the how and the why really, you know, wasn't clearly articulated. Um, and a lot of times the management team didn't see until that sales rep came back 90 days later. I committed 400. What did I actually do? And, you know, I was a winner or I was a loser on that. You know, today, I think technology, you know, uh, because you can see the meetings people are having and because you can see the, you know, the emails that they're sending and the, you know, all of those kind of conversational metrics. And um, we have some AI tools that actually listen to our phone calls and kind of rate the quality of the conversation and how much you're talking, how much you're listening, stuff like that. You know, suddenly it's not just I've made a four hundred thousand dollar commitment, um, but it's actually supported by, and these are the deals that I'm committing, and these are the deals that are stretches, um, and then our managers can actually go coach in, you know, on in, in real time basis on okay, you know, this particular stretch deal, um, the data says 
you've sent them eight emails over the past three weeks and they've not responded to any of them. Yeah, you know, you haven't had a scheduled appointment with any decision makers in that organization for two months, yet you're forecasting the deal's gonna close in a week. You know, that's just not possible. Um, and so there's a lot more ability to inspect the, the how and the why something's gonna happen and then coach reps to get better at it. Um, so as a result, I think the forecasts we have are much better and more accurate, but also the skill of the seller is vastly improved because you know we can coach on much more specific actionable stuff. Yeah, superb. I mean, you know, I wasn't a seller in those early 2000s, but I could imagine if you're going to a company meeting and committing a number. I was having a conversation today, actually. It's really interesting to see how personalities interact with those forecasts and those targets. <laughs> um, and I can imagine, and would you agree or, or disagree, absolutely, that it's perhaps becoming um, less entwined with people's personalities and more data driven um, and therefore more objective. Would that be true? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I'm telling my sellers is I, I don't want you to be the superhero with the cape. Yeah. I just want you to be right. Yeah. And so, you know, I think there are a lot of reps who grew up feeling like um, I, I'm going to really under I'm going to really under commit. And then I'll have the ability at the end of the quarter to just surprise everyone with and look at this extra deal and look at this extra deal and look at this extra deal. Um, and they think that there's some sort of superhero about that. Yeah. You know, the problem is if you've undercommitted, I've spent the last 90 days assuming you were being honest and I've underinvested in the yeah. in the organization because, you know, I didn't think I was going to have money to invest that it turns out I really did. You know, now the reverse is true. You know, there are there are reps with big egos who want to start by saying I'm going to be the number one rep and I don't really have a plan to get there. But, you know, I'm committing a million dollars. And then they never get there and, and they fall, you know, 20, 30, 40% short. That's obviously no good either because I've expected this outcome that you can't deliver. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of talk a lot about the Goldilocks of sales, you know, not too big, not too small, but just right. Um, and yeah, you'll have some surprises and you'll have some things that will, you know, surprisingly turn out well, or you'll miss a little bit, but on the whole, you know, it's way better to be right and accurate with me, no matter what the number is than it is to, you know, be wildly off over or under. That's superb. Um, question for you, JD, perhaps a closing one, because we're sadly coming close to the end of the time. Well, we went um, fast. <laughs> yeah, I know. If you're in a room full of CROs, you know, Pat, let's just imagine the superheroes out there, the best in the world. Uh, what questions would you want to ask these folks? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm really getting intrigued by is uh, the the influence of social selling. Yeah. Um, so this is not a very tactical, mechanical thing, but um, so much more of how people do business is conversations like the one that we're having today, you know, podcasts, LinkedIn posts, you know, blogging, conversations and, and communications that aren't about selling, but are nevertheless, you know, communicating something about your brand or about your business. Um, and I think there's a lot of really cool insight we can get about our customers and about our competitors and about our marketplace and all of these sort of unofficial sales channels. Um, so I really want to hear from from other, you know, revenue leaders about, you know, how are they leveraging those tools and what are the the good successes and and insights we're going to get there. Um, from a you know from a very revenue operations uh, perspective. Uh, there's a lot that I want to learn about how can we better coach reps when we're not in the room with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, especially now that we're at home and we're not traveling to go see customers anymore, uh, you know, people are out there having conversations that you don't have visibility and insight to. And yes, you can listen to call recordings or you can kind of dial into a Zoom meeting or, you know, over here in some ways. But um, in many ways, our teams are way more autonomous than they were when they were in a physical office. Um, so really, I think 2021 is going to be about how do you get better insight into what's going on out there in, in the world with your reps on a daily basis, and how can you impact that and influence it? Um, so I have a ton to learn there from it, from my peers, I think. Yeah, superb. I love that. And it's, it's obviously a brave new world, this this landscape of social selling. And it's very different to the marketing we might be aware of a, a decade or so ago. 
Um, JD, I really love that conversation. Uh, I find this piece so interesting between philosophy of sales and how should we therefore run our sales floor, but also how that helps us pull sales levers. And I think you had a really good insight into that. Um, and plus the world of world of forecast is really great too. Um, sadly, so many people are still doing stuff on Excel and it's good to see you guys are, are leveling up there, which is great. So thank you so much.